you know, what we're hearing in terms of demand, you know, from, from institutions is to be able to leverage that technology and like understand that, you know, that it, it is an efficient mechanism for lending, for swapping, for staking, doing a whole bunch of things. But there's some enhancements that can be made to the infrastructure of these protocols on the contract level as well, on the pool level, as well as like on the token level that will enable um, a much more institutional look and feel, but still get the benefits of DeFi protocol. Welcome to the ATX DAO podcast, the hub for exploring the forefront of blockchain technology and Austin's Web3 community. Your hosts, Nick, Mason, Luke, and Ash, connect you with innovators within ATX DAO and beyond as we venture into the world of decentralized technology. So crack open a beer and join us for a front row seat to learn about the innovations and trends shaping our digital future. This is the ATX DAO podcast. Thank you for joining us. I know we kind of... We had a chance to meet just through a panel at ETH Denver. Uh, yep. Thanks to Panoptic for putting that on there. Um, and Jim uh, was super cool uh, on the panel. If you, for those of you who don't know, the panel is also out. Panoptic has posted it on Twitter. Um, definitely good to check it out. I think from what I've heard, it seems to be the most casual and like kind of based conversation throughout the entirety of the day. Uh, but like that being said, like Jim. Thank you for coming on here, man. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's great to see you again. Yeah, it was fun to spend some time in Denver. You know, I tried to dress it a little bit more casual today because you gave me, um, you know, a little bit of heat for wearing a suit at, uh, at, the, at the last uh, time we met. But um, no, things are going well. You know, sunny day here in San Diego as it normally is. So I can't complain. That's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you just decided to do, you know, a little bit of a dress down approach today. Uh, it is... But I, I was giving a little, for those of you who don't know, I was giving him a little, like, shit about the fact that he wore a suit, like, they, well, he didn't wear a suit. He wore, like, a nice blazer, actually, to sure. the actual event. I, I, I was kind of jelly, actually. That was a kick-ass blazer. It looked super suave, actually. <laughs> uh, but, like, uh, it, it, it is, it was kind of fun. It was, and he took the ribbing in, like, in stride, which was awesome. And, but... Uh, you know, like, we're here to talk about RWAs, and those of you that you know, that don't know first time listeners of the show, um, you know, Jim is the head of BD at Superstate, which is a super cool company that is an asset management firm. And they're looking to modernize infrastructure of investment funds. Um, but dude, like before we jump into Superstate, I'd love to hear a little bit about you and like how you got into the space. And like you mentioned before we hit recording uh, that you come from a banking background as well. Unfortunately, all of us are ex suits or in the point of transitioning, but love to hear your story, Brett. Yeah, no, thanks again for having me and, and Luke. It's great to spend some time together. So, yeah, my, I mean, my background, I, I came out of college and was like, I'm going to go to Wall Street. So I went to City um, in New York and thought, hey, I'm, I finally made it. But, you know, wake up every day and I was doing a bunch of spreadsheets and, you know, reconciling trades in the back office and not really doing the fun stuff on the on the front office. So, um, realized pretty quickly this is going to be turned into machines or an offshore type of role at some point. And so why not, uh, you know, take myself away from kind of the like more data processing things and, and actually do something fun in the, in the space. And so, um, you know, I spent most of my career in fintech, um, you know, always kind of at the center of asset management banks. Um, you know, there's, uh, it was kind of a long journey there, building out a couple of companies and then, um, you know, was always interested in crypto, especially as I saw a lot of the more sophisticated clients that that I had relationships with and, and some of the VCs that were really starting to dive into crypto um, made it seem like there was a lot of uh, opportunity on the institutional side, which has always been my my forte. And so, you know, I left, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to join Robert Leshner and the team over at Compound. And it was, you know, back in May of 2022, um, finally joined the team to help kind of run the institutional business there. And, you know, the goal for, for that business was effectively, you know, helping folks that wanted to interact with the protocol, but weren't necessarily set up to do so directly, um, you know, could work through us at Compound Treasury. Uh, very successful, had a couple hundred million in asset center management at its peak. 
Um, but, you know, realize it was a pretty narrow scope of what we were trying to do, you know, really just focus on one protocol, uh, growing, you know, adoption at Compound, which was a fantastic business. But, you know, as we kind of looked together and thought, you know, can we expand what we're doing here in a more, um, you know, global way, we decided to about, you know, 15 months ago, spin out a Compound and launch Superstate. So Robert, myself, uh, and two other folks that, uh, Dean and Reed that were, running the institutional business at Compound, um, launched Superstate and officially raised our seed in April of 2023. And yeah, we launched uh, you know an asset management business, um, very traditional type of structure underneath the hood, which we'll kind of get into, but um, very next gen on the top of the surface where you have investors that are looking to get exposure to things that they hold in traditional bank accounts or brokerage accounts or whatever it is and bring it on chain. Um, you know, we started that journey um, with our first product that we just launched uh, back in January called USTV. And I've seen a ton of, uh, ton of traction, but um, just a very cliche tip of the iceberg of all the things that we want to do. And, you know, it's great to just continue on that thread of my career of, you know, being very, very, um, you know, institutional, but also, you know, staying at the forefront of technology and innovation. And, you know, Superstate is kind of bringing those two worlds together under one roof. Yeah, that's super cool. I mean, it seems like your journey from journey to Wall Street and being on the, the suit side of things to now kind of like, you know, on the flip flop and hoodie kind of things, but like also walking those both paths, right? Like of uh, trying to get institutions to understand and leverage the tech and trying to get retail side and crypto side to like leverage to be like, hey, you should adopt this whole other world that's there as well, um, which is really, really interesting. I would uh, I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about, you know, the first product that you said you launched. Uh, could we dive into that a little bit more? Yeah. So it's um, the super state. It's a, basically a money market fund that we built. If you think about the underlying fund itself, it's very traditional. There's securities, you know, that go into a custodian and those securities are ultra short T-bills. So they're like 15, 30 day weighted average maturity T-bills. Um, those are all held in a separate trust. You know, it's set up in a way that looks exactly like a mutual fund or an ETF is structured in the like registered security world. And we did that on purpose in order to um, take, you know, the advantages of decades of history of investor protections and um, the infrastructure there is definitely tried and true in terms of enabling investors to get the exposures that they want in a functional, you know, product that um, is extremely, extremely safe. Um, and so what we do with the investors experience, though, is we allow them to tokenize shares in the fund. And that is obviously very brand new compared to what you think about of a traditional mutual fund where, you know, historically you log into your brokerage account or you go to Vanguard and you buy a mutual fund and it just kind of sits there. Um, it gives you the, you know, asset allocation that you're looking for and a variety of different asset classes, um, but there's a very limited opportunity for what you can actually do with that asset, except for just buy and sell and do it through that one application or that one interface. Um, but doing it through a token opens up the funnel and the, the use cases to what blockchains are great for, which is composability and interoperability. So um, yeah, USTB, you know, is it's for qualified purchasers only at the moment. It's a private fund. So we're structured it in a way that um, allows us to face off with larger institutions that are looking to, you know, get exposure to uh, the yield that the front end of the treasury curve is spitting off given where rates are um, versus just holding, you know, cash or stable coins where they're not getting paid any yield. It's a great, you know, balance sheet asset, but it's also got a lot more bells and whistles to it because it's sitting in a token. Um, it's launched on Ethereum right now. It's an ERC-20 token. So, from a you know tokenized perspective, it's it's extremely um, you know it's been a product you know it's in a structure that pretty much every protocol knows how to work with and every custodian knows how to work with and that's why we built it in this way is that it's you know something that is not novel in in the like that aspect of it but it's very novel underneath the hood um, the experience from a client's perspective is is you know pretty streamlined. They're able to purchase shares in the fund with stable coins. So they can send us USDC to invest in the fund or they can send us dollars. 
And then we just mint back to them in the wallets that they hold on chain that we've whitelisted because we know that this is a counterparty that we've already KYC. They're able to hold those assets, um, whether it's at Anchorage or BitGo or Fireblocks or maybe even self-custody, any Ethereum address that they control, they can hold these tokens in, which is, again, going back to the contrast to the TradFi world, totally different than just being restricted to you know one platform where you need to hold the assets. And you know it opens up a huge surface area, basically unlimited surface area of different opportunities to use these assets in interesting ways because of the programmability and the composability of a, of a token. That's totally different than, you know, something that's sitting off chain. Um, so yeah, we're super excited about it. It is, uh, you know, as we're recording now, we're sitting at like 87 million in assets under management. So great traction out of the gate and we're, we're fast, uh, you know, growing our client base to help them, you know, generate in more yield for their balance sheet and then use these assets in really interesting ways for settlement or collateral or other secondary markets. So like, so then do you feel like that most institutions are looking for in the crypto space, like more yield in terms of like these kind of products and that they're familiar with and that they feel comfortable with, or is it like, no, we're really looking for composability because you mentioned that you launched in the Ethereum ecosystem, right? And that is a huge cap, deep liquid market. But I'm just wondering, like, what do you think that they prioritize? Or is it other things that they prioritize, you feel? Well, it's both. So it's not an either or thing. Um, I think what they love about blockchains is the composability and the interaction that you can have with certain assets across different protocols, um, whether it's using those collateral on DeFi or being able to send assets instantaneously at the speed of a blockchain versus the speed of fiat rails. So that, you know, experience is, you know, extremely different than the traditional world. Uh, plus, it also gives them, you know, the ability to self custody. Like I mentioned, we're not holding the keys of their assets. We mint tokens that represent the shares that they have in the fund to wherever they want to hold them. So they have like a holistic view of their whole portfolio, whether it's like Bitcoin, ETH, stake this, like uh, meme coin, that whatever it might be that's sitting in their in their wallet. It's also complemented with this fund that is a money market fund, effectively under the hood. And so they have like an aggregate experience to see all of that on chain. Um, I think what's happened, you know, given where Fed funds rate is over the last, you know, couple of years is it's really brought to the attention that, you know, there's a ton of money that's just sitting in stable coins. It's kind of burning a hole in a lot of people's pockets um, when they're just holding them. Now, stable coins have an amazing and they were like the first RW way, right? Like they have an amazing, amazing use case for a lot of different reasons and different demographics. Um, and so, um there's, but there's an opportunity for folks that are just sitting on any of those assets. It's just like dry powder sitting in their balance sheet. Um, they're losing a lot of money by not increasing their, you know, their exposure to yield. And so bringing in something that is backed by treasury bills, for example, which is the most risk-free asset on the planet, especially ultra short duration ones, like the 15, 30 day ones that we hold in the portfolio, um, brings those two worlds together. And it says, and it gives them an opportunity to, to continue to grow their portfolio um, when, you know, they might have a, a risk off position or they're also able to offset some of their funding costs from a, you know, capital efficiency perspective, if they're borrowing or, or posting collateral to a counterparty, um, doing that with cash is earning you zero on your collateral versus doing it with something that's paying you 5% dramatically reduces your borrow costs and it increases the ability for you to get leverage or to perform, you know, certain trades that you would otherwise not have access to or, or be able to maximize if you weren't getting the kind of yield on the product underneath the hood. So um, I think, you know, kind of going back to the other point about how we structure this, I, you know, institutions are, are certainly chasing for yield, right? Like this, especially in the environment that we're in right now, but not all of them are comfortable with, you know, lending to a DeFi protocol where they're unsure of what the risks are in a particular new pool or an existing pool. Um, or they're even like their compliance team say, you know, we're a large asset manager and we're just not going to allow you to lend to a market that we don't know who all the other participants are on the other side. You might be licking your chops at the yield that's available there, but we're just not, we're going to prevent you from being able to participate. And so um, for there's a whole gradient of, you know, market participants, of course. But for the ones that are like super institutional that say, you know, I'm putting a bunch of money in JP Morgan or Bank of America, or whatever it is to get treasury bills, but I want to be able to do that on chain. The product that we built, especially given that it's in a very 
um, you know, tried and true and bankruptcy remote type structure, like I described earlier, gives them the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's a very good point. I mean, like, it's really funny because you don't know who's uh, sitting on the other side of the trade, right? Right. Or who's committing to the same kind of liquidity that you're doing. And that's like the first big red flag, right? Even for a retail participant, they're like, oh my God, who am I getting mixed up with here? Or who's responsible for this protocol and booing everything uh, it, to make sure that it works? Um, it, it's really interesting also that you mentioned the fact that, you know, Compound uh, and Maker and everything that's there came from this die and the stablecoin perspective. I was curious to see, like, you know, you're the head of BD, I, and you know, every startup is kind of like you have to wear many hats. Like, mm -hmm. do you have a chance to like really come in and then help like expand the surface area and the deployment of these kind of products? Um, because like you know, you have a wealth of experience. I'm just curious to see in this first fund, like, did, were you like, hey? It has to work in this kind of way because they, this is the audience that we're kind of like going to serve. I'm just curious to see how that would work. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about a go-to-market strategy, regardless of the product that you're doing, um, you're going to go nowhere if you try to boil the ocean and do everything all at once. You have, you know, very specific pain points and target markets that you focus on initially, and you focus on certain channel or distribution partners initially that you know, satisfy a particular pain point and an immediate need for you to be able to get lift right out of the gate. And then as you start to, you know, evolve your product and educate the market, you start to go up that curve of additional adopters that might not be there day one for whatever reason. And that might be from a tech compliance, you know, just demand perspective. And so you have to work sequentially, you know, or, you know, so, yeah, uh, uh, from one audience to the next and grow the pie as you go along. Um, a lot of that comes down to education, but a lot of that also comes down to listening as well too. And so what we do in you know, our existing process now is you know, spend a lot of time with the folks that are really crypto native, because like I mentioned, you know, clients that are holding shares in our fund, they can tokenize those and put them on chain. And what does that mean? That means you probably already are on chain. You already have a custodian or you already have a wallet and you're like comfortable with assets being there. And so um, we're not necessarily going after folks that have never put any money on chain ever and you know trying to get them to put money on chain today. Now that doesn't mean that we're not gonna do that tomorrow um, or we're working through that process as it stands and you know, creating more education. It's kind of similar to how the Bitcoin ETF has gone to market. Like there's immediate demand from certain cohorts of investors that just like weren't comfortable buying stuff on Coinbase, but they wanted exposure to the asset class. So like they're putting, you know, billions of dollars into IBIT and the Fidelity funds and all that day one. But as you see, like the Bitwise folks and the BlackRock folks and the Fidelity folks, like they're out there educating other personas or other types of clients to be able to give them exposure an experience or give them an understanding of what this asset class does. And it's very similar from a tokenization standpoint. Um, and that changes from, you know, different types of clients that you're talking to, different, um, you know, jurisdictions that you're talking to, and then how your product evolves ensures that you're able to address the market and maximize opportunities where, you know, things might not be there today, but as you continue to progress and the market continues to mature um, and the like education is there, there's more opportunities that um, you you have that, that can grow your business. So, you know, because I came from a world where like my prior, you know, before uh, super state compound treasury was, it was a lot of education people like, how does the protocol even work? And like, there's a lot that you do to describe, you know, what are smart contracts and like, what is like, how does the programmatic interest rates work? Like, what are C tokens? Like, there's a lot of stuff you do there to give them the basics, which I think a lot of people probably listening to this today, like already understand because Robert, you know, built this, you know, back five years ago and the market has picked up, but not everybody out there, if you're a large bank or you're a large family office or a pension fund, like really understands how these operate. So we spent a lot of our time like doing, you know, that type of basic education. And that's what I've done throughout my entire career, which is why I think like we're uniquely positioned in this market to not just launch a product and hope that there's demand, but it's also to work through, you know, audiences that are not quite on chain yet to you know, help them understand why they should be on chain and what the benefits are to doing that and de-risking it in a way that makes them feel comfortable because the USTB outside of a token is something that everybody probably invests in today. And just like you go to your brokerage account and you just put money in a money market fund. Like that's just 
that's why we built it as the first product that we launched because that almost you know is an aside to the rest of the benefits of what the product can do. Very cool. So you mentioned a little bit about kind of the the onboarding experience, and I think I think that's smart going after the folks that are already you know involved in crypto that type of thing. Um, can you talk just a little bit about what that experience is like? So I'm a institutional investor. I you know know about crypto. I do that, but I want to get involved. You mentioned the KYC process and whitelisting. Maybe kind of talk through. I, I want to buy some some of the the treasuries. Yeah. So like in this fund, it's, it's a private fund. So there's a subset of the, you know, total financial services ecosystem that we're able to, um, uh, onboard or that are able to invest in this product. So, you know, the kind of process, once we've identified, um, a potential investor is, you know, obviously walk them through the diligence process of understanding all that I just described with a heck of a lot more detail and information to, you know, help them underwrite the, you know, risks, the legal, the ops and all the tech associated with, um, you know, the business understanding of what this product can do for their, their P and L. Um, but when a client comes to us and wants to onboard, you know, we take very standard KYC information We're you know, we have a uh, general counsel, a CCO, uh, you know, a team that is all responsible for taking the like standard documents from a client that you probably would get when you open a bank account, right. Or that you would share when you open a bank account or you would want to invest in like a normal security. Um, it is all information that we perform diligence on. We turn it around super quickly once we, you know, feel comfortable that that investor meets the criteria that we need to satisfy our regulatory obligations. Um, at that stage, you know, they're actually able to say, "Hey, here's the list of addresses on Ethereum that I want to hold this token in." And so we're then, as part of the approval process. Um, separate to the token, there's a smart contract called an allow list. And that allow list is just basically, you know, a full register of all of the Ethereum addresses associated with the investors that are able to interact with the token. Um, so once they're onboarded to, you know, both the, uh, the fund and the allow list, investors are able to send USDC or dollars into the fund and we, we mint tokens right back to them. So um, after you know, that, that initial onboarding, it's really up to them to be able to um, purchase and redeem as they need from their, from their balance sheet. And all of that done is in a very, it's all that is done in a very crypto native way. Um, we try to build in a very elegant experience that doesn't require them to you know, submit a request and pick up the phone and call or send emails or log into a portal. Like they can literally click buttons on chain from their custodian if they're sending USDC in or they want to burn tokens. So it's a really, really elegant experience once they've gotten kind of on that onboarding process, um, gotten through that onboarding process. That's awesome. And I, I like what you said too, about being able to have everything like their portfolio can all be together. So if they're investing in, you know, other coins, that type of thing, they can see it all together. I think that definitely is nice from a, you know, just a visibility perspective. So I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, it saves a ton of workflow because like, you know, a lot of investors, like let's say you are a hedge fund, right. And you just had a really great gain in some part of your portfolio and you want to realize that gain, you want to reduce the risk in your portfolio and, and kind of go to cash, let's say. Um, what happens is like you're going to sell a bunch of Bitcoin, let's say for dollars, and then you're going to move those dollars, you know, once they get into your account, into a money market fund and then call it, you know, a couple of days later, or maybe a couple of hours later, you're like, oh, I want to go risk on again and buy something else. It's like, okay, now I got to move money back from, from the money market fund to the bank, the bank to the counterparty, and now I can hold the tokens in my wallet. Like having something that's tokenized that gives you, that just like cuts out like all of those steps is massively more efficient. And it also has that like holistic view directly in your portfolio. So um, it kind of saves both from like a workflow, like operational burden standpoint, where you don't have to like spend a bunch of time figuring out where the money is moving. And you can just do it all from like one console and see it all pretty much instantaneously, especially because it's all on chain. Yeah, it's funny how like UX is like one of those key things that like even in crypto, like has been very, very hard to get right, right with DeFi native applications. And it seems like we have to look at like traditional finance or like Web2 kind of models to like really replicate this, right? Um, sometimes like vanilla things always work better. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, like, you know, like the tech itself leverages the fact that we don't need middlemen. Right. Like we, we basically are cutting out all that excess waste, uh, in this whole tech stack, which is pretty awesome. Um, but like, but my question is then like, what do you think is the, the leading indicators for the next wave of assets to come on chain? 
and like what do you think is really possible to get tokenized i mean like there's this famous thing i mean i'm guessing robert also says this like tokenize everything right mm -hmm. uh within reason i'm sure but like the question is like what do you really think is the is next yeah i mean there's a big big asterisk on that and i think you know robert has um you know, shared his thoughts on this quite a bit. And, and we all fully subscribe to this, which is, yeah, you can tokenize anything. Um, but it's, it's really based on demand. Like, why would you bring something on chain if nobody wants to buy it? Um, you can originate, the technology is there, right? And like the legal structures are starting to get more and more formalized behind it to be able to, you know, demonstrate ownership of a particular asset from like a traditional legal, you know, framework. But putting something in a token with no marketplace or no demand on the other side is, is kind of a moot point. So I, I think what we've seen is, you know, really a barbell distribution thus far on the type of assets that have come on chain. And like one end of the spectrum is the category that USTB is in, which is like highly liquid treasury bills. So it's like, you know, looking at the last stats is somewhere around a billion dollars worth of total AUM in these types of products. Some of that is double counting, but um, call it like, 750 million to to a to billion dollars worth of assets. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got, you know, folks like Apollo and KKR and Hamilton Lane that have done a lot of work to bring illiquid alts on chain. And there's a ton of benefits that get unlocked by tokenizing an asset and opening up a new distribution channel that historically was not available to like high net worth, not like ultra, ultra high net worth, but like high net worth individuals that previously didn't have access to these products because, you know, the origination and distribution of that was so time consuming and there was a lot of lawyers, a lot of paperwork. And so it just doesn't make sense to do that unless you're going to get like a $20 million check in the fund. Um, but now through a token, you can like automate a lot of that stuff and reduce the friction there and just plug it directly in, you know, behind the scenes to a, a, a wealth advisor, for example. Um, I think that like those two ends of the spectrum are obviously going to converge towards the middle. Now, I think what super state is going to be focusing on is actually going from the conservative end of the spectrum of being like super boring and like building out the pipes and the rails and the, and the integrations and expanding up the curve um, with additional risk assets, like whether that's longer duration assets, whether it's other types of credit, um, you know, other yield bearing assets in, in, you know, the traditional world, or it's you know things like equities or, or whatnot. I mean, we're very focused on wrapping traditional assets and having you know highly liquid instruments that investors want exposure to. So um, I don't know if you saw this, but a couple of weeks ago we announced what's called the Super State Industry Council, and that's comprised of like 20, 25 folks at the moment um, that are both on the buy side and sell side. And you know the kind of reason for for building this out is like going back to my days when I was. Uh, in fintech, it's like getting a community of people together around, you know, a big regime change is really beneficial because it helps engage with the both buy side demand and sell side, you know, distribution to unlock opportunities where you're not just building products just to build products. And so this group is, you know, very uh, very sophisticated players, both on the hedge fund, VC, prime brokerage, market maker, you know, crypto native industry um, that we're bringing together on a regular basis to walk through, you know, all that I described on USTB and say like, okay, what other venues should this be accessible on? How, you know, within your workflow today of when you're doing an OTC derivatives trade, like, where should this, you know, what counterparties should we work with to enable this as collateral? Where in custody do you want to use this from like a safety and security standpoint? Are there any, you know, platforms that we should be getting supported on? Um, you know, on the like settlement side, you know, who are you trading with? And like, where do you want to be able to use this to like go from that USTB position to that Bitcoin position and making sure that those, um, that connected tissue is there in addition to saying, okay, you know, this is the first fund. You're not going to just be a monolithic fund issuer. Like Superstate is going to have tons of different funds and tons of different products that we offer to clients. What's next? You know, and instead of just like taking a leap and saying we're going to do a, I don't know, uh, an art fund. You know, pointing to my 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 fake Basquiat back here. Like 
we could do that, but who the heck wants to buy it? If we hear a bunch of people want to buy it, then we'll go and create those assets and bring them on chain for the, where the demand is. So um, yeah, there's a lot that you can do. And this is like this whole spectrum of, of uh, risk assets um, have different use cases, whether it's the conservative side or the highly illiquid side. And I think all of it's going to take time to get on chain, but we're going to be methodical along the way. Yeah, I love this idea of like, I mean, it goes back to kind of the way you were, your response earlier, right? You have this bespoke generalism, right? Where you kind of have to put the customer first and you have to understand what they really want. And it's really cool that you form this kind of like brain trust to like basically understand like, bro, like what the fuck do you really want? So we can like make this happen, right? Um, I'm really holding back my pirate words today, by the way. Really, really struggling, considering my kiddo is like just on the other side of his room. So uh, <laughs> I got one today and I got to put some money in a cookie jar. Um, yeah, but like, I mean, I love that idea because like it, it actually goes back to like what a successful startup really should be, right? Is like identifying what is a problem. And the only one who can really tell you what the problem is, is the customer. And like for you guys, you guys take it uh, a step further by basically forming, you know, two sets of these customers to really understand how do we create these markets, which is like pretty, pretty, like you would think it's, it, you would think it, like everyone should be doing it, but very many startups don't do that. Yeah. Um, and it, it's awesome that you guys have always stuck to that core ethos of doing that. Yeah, um, I mean, that's why we were strategic about, you know, what our cap table looks like and, and the types of clients that we really focus on early out of the gate. Um, and we're not pulling demand out of them. They're pulling demand out of, uh, they're sending demand to us. And, you know, I think that's, that's always been, you know, the ethos for very successful businesses is to, to make sure, like, go back to Bezos. It's like customer, customer, customer. It's like the only thing that you should be thinking about is what your customer wants 24 seven and building the things that they, that they really care about. And, you know, we are very, very committed to making sure that that community is not just a press release of like a bunch of people that are, you know, getting together once. Like we have a very regimented program on a regular basis of bringing this community together with very specific tactical and strategic um, objectives that will enable us to, you know, foster the entire growth of the industry. And like this is not a selfish super state thing, right? Like we're not just trying to do it to make sure that we build you know, amazing products. Like our goal is to ensure that the entire industry continues to flourish. Like clearly 2024 has been a m multiple narratives, but one of them that has stayed completely consistent all the way through the bear market has been RWAs. And you're seeing, you know, folks like BlackRock, you've got obviously Franklin Templeton who pioneered a fund like a couple of years ago, you've got Wisdom Tree, you've got international asset managers like Fidelity tokenized a fund, you know, on um, ZK Sync, I think it is. So like there's clearly a lot of institutional demand for like this new share class, if you will, of, of a tokenized uh, asset. And, you know, there's there's just a fundamental shift of how capital markets are operating from this like legacy, you know, books and records onto a much more efficient settlement rail. And we want to be working through the folks that are like the early adopters that like really understand the tech and really understand like where the best benefit could be on this chain, that chain, this protocol, that protocol, and foster the growth of the entire industry so that everything has a chance to, to flourish and we can pioneer a lot of that and be, you know, be at the forefront of building all of it. Yeah, I mean, like the markets are really spoken, right? Like I saw this, um, I saw this thing posted by Chow, who's like one of the founders of Alliance Dow. And he's posted like these CoinGecko stats that talked about like the most popular narrative. I mean, the, the markets are like saying that, you know, meme coins are up like a thousand and thirteen percent and RWAs are up like 300 percent, like 268 percent. It would have been nice if we got that extra point. We could have had the nice meme around that too. But like it is crazy. Uh, it is really seemed to be like 2024 seems to be the year of like RWAs being like a real thing. Right. Like it is. But like. Let me ask you this then, like with the narratives of all the capital flows of all these products that are coming in, I was just curious to see, you know, part of the brain trust that's there, are, are there any like new exciting tech stack in uh, like, in, like additives that you're looking to see being built out for these products or any of your customers have specifically requested? Yeah. I mean, without giving away too much of the secret sauce, I mean, I think the ability for um, projects like ours to create much more compliant 
infrastructure in a DeFi protocol um, will unlock a tremendous amount of opportunity. I think there's a lot of hesitation. You know, if, if you look back at the last cycle, right? Like, obviously, we had a very biased first person perspective sitting at Compound. Like, DeFi did exactly what it was supposed to do, despite massive deleveraging of every asset on the planet, uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. Um, and not the centralized desks did not hold up well at all because they were not managing risk in a way that, you know, would allow them to see through that cycle. And that's caused a lot of damage and a lot of pain. So from a narrative perspective, I think, you know, DeFi over CeFi, you know, clearly proved out to be, um, you know, a strong tailwind to heading into this next cycle where, you know, institutions realize like, okay, there is actually something here that like, despite all that happened, Compound, Aave, and all these other protocols like continued to hum with no bad debt on their books. Like there was risk management that was enforced proactively and systematically all, all along the way that you can't do on a spreadsheet and you can't do with people and you can clearly do through smart contracts. The challenge though is to interact with those protocols if you're an institution, it's kind of going back to like what we talked about earlier. Um, it's really scary because you don't know who's on the other side. You don't know how to underwrite the the risk of a particular pool. And so I think, you know, what we're hearing in terms of demand, you know, from, from institutions is to be able to leverage that technology and like understand that, you know, that it, it is an efficient mechanism for lending, for swapping, for staking, doing a whole bunch of things. Um, but there's some enhancements that can be made to the infrastructure of these protocols on the contract level as well on the pool level as well as like on the token level that will enable um, a much more institutional look and feel but still get the benefits of DeFi protocols like if you think about you know how uh TradFi works like you, your assets stay in custody and those are moved from you know one counterparty to another in a you know way that the um state streets and the bonies of the world, you know, help facilitate trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of capital movements and protections on a hour by hour basis, like second by second basis. Um, that type of stuff is possible on DeFi, but it's not possible in a permissionless pool um, or it's not it's not a, it's not uh, possible on, you know, certain types of market structures. But if you have um, a change of market structure, then you can bring those institutions in where they still feel comfortable, like, hey, my assets are still sitting in Anchorage, but I'm interacting with a protocol or my assets are moving from one counterparty to the next. And, you know, if I don't know exactly who the person is on the other side, I am comfortable because I know programmatically based off of the allow list that, you know, Jim just described earlier, like that's another KYC institution that I can trust is somebody that my compliance department won't kill me for, you know, sourcing capital from or for trading against. Um, and so there's a there's a lot to be done. You know, this is not going to happen by the end of this year or by the end of, you know, the, the next quarter. But there's a long trajectory towards building these types of institutional products. And like the tech is there and the the, the appreciation, and understanding of the, you know, the, the, the protocols are there. It's just a matter of like working through um, designing those systems so that you're able to onboard a ton of capital that otherwise is, is prevented from being in the space right now. I'm curious to see, do you feel like these advancements were a result of regulation or is it like, do you see like, oh no, we looking ahead of the curve when we see that regulatory environments are going to come in, that's basically going to, and we are probably in the forefront of this regulatory crosshairs. Like, because DeFi has traditionally always been like, oh, you know, like they're after us. You know, but in your case, like you're moving up the curve, like you said, and you're trying to, you know, basically build products for institutional level players to come into the space. Uh, you know, are, is this like the, it, I'm just asking, is this like a chicken or egg kind of thing? You know, um, it depends on the jurisdiction um, because there are certain regions within, you know, Asia, within Europe, within uh, Middle East that are proactively engaging with developers, with uh, institutions with um, entrepreneurs to be able to like collaboratively build these systems together and, and kind of define the rules of the road. Um, I think domestically we are behind the curve and, you know, that's not new news to anybody that's in this space. Um, but I think there's still a tremendous amount of continued progress that's being made from a legal regulatory perspective to ensure that what we're building 
satisfies regulatory obligations. There's, you know, very, very, very few people that are trying to skirt the rules. There's a lot of people that are trying to comply or figure out ways to comply or find rules that work. I think in like the RWA space, it's a little bit more clear than it is in like, you know, the protocol or, or governance token or, or, you know, the other you know, aspects of crypto. For RWAs, like you're originating a product that has roots in rules from like the 1940s or the 1930s. And so that's what we, you know, focus on at Superstate is like, okay, let's build stuff that aligns to the regulatory objectives, but let's push the, the envelope further. So, you know, what I haven't mentioned yet is towards the middle of last summer, we actually filed a prospectus with the SEC and proposed what a 40 act mutual fund with trillions of dollars trade in every day could look like if it was tokenized. And, you know, Franklin Templeton has built a product like this. Wisdom Tree has built a product like that, that has a dual, you know, source of books and records and, and kind of has like a traditional transfer agent and a secondary books and records on chain. And, you know, there's limitations to what the regulators will allow you to do to like fully bring all of the infrastructure on chain. Um, but I think that there's uh, opportunities to progress the conversation forward. And, and you know, we're certainly going to continue that dialogue with um, and collaborate with the regulators to ensure that um, more investors than just qualified purchasers can benefit from products like this domestically and really turn, you know, traditional structures that like started as mutual funds and turned into ETFs because there was a lot of innovation on like how you could actually turn a pool of capital into a highly liquid product. You know, there's opportunities to evolve that even further and using this new um, operating system of financial services that like right now you're prevented from doing a whole lot with in the existing regulatory climate that, you know, we'll, we'll see those things hopefully change over the next couple of years and um, continue to work to, to push the boundaries, but now never overstep the boundaries on our end. So, th I mean, I guess that goes to my last two questions, right? And Luke, feel free to jump in, bud. Cause like, you know, um, the, my question is just like, what is some misconceptions that like people who are on the TradFi side, you know, who are looking to jump into the space or like basically bring their clientele base into it? Like, you know, wealth management style, right? Like, I mean, ING or UBS basically being like, hey, we have like a whole host of these clients that are HNWIs or UNHWIs, like they should be exposed to these asset classes or, you know, something traditional like, you know, Goldman Sachs. We're like, hey, we need to come in here. These, our clients are asking for this. What are some misconceptions that you would immediately be like, bro, like, this is something you need to know so that you don't have to worry so much about this. Well, I think it depends. I mean, it's such a broad category of digital assets, right? And so, you know, uh, clearly Bitcoin has gotten to a point where there's just broad adoption and uh, education about what that asset does and why it's digital gold and how it can complement an existing portfolio and why it should be held in something that is very traditional and common across, you know, trillions of dollars of capital in an ETF, or if investors so choose, hold it in custody or go to Coinbase and buy a bunch of Bitcoin. Um, you know, if you go like further out the spectrum, there's still so much uncertainty that investors are dealing with in terms of how do I invest in certain assets? Um, based off of just the lack of regulatory clarity of like, is this a commodity, is this a security? And, and that stuff will continue to evolve. I think the like RWA side, kind of going back to like my wheelhouse, there was originally, I think, a lot of hesitation to build products from an institutional standpoint, or at least this narrative that like institutions would never build on public blockchains. And, you know, Superstate has proven that wrong. BlackRock just launched a fund on Ethereum. like. There's more understanding that these public networks are a safe place to build. And the like information that's being shared back to ultimate investors is that, you know, this operating system that is now facilitating the movement of capital is something that is extremely resilient. It's extremely robust. It has a lot of benefits and there's that education, I think, has started to permeate through institutional circles that allowing people to feel comfortable to launch on Arbitrum, to launch on Polygon, to launch on like, you name it, a bunch of L2s, a bunch of Solana. Like there's a ton of um, 
projects that are building, even like Avalanche, for example, like Avalanche has, you know, they have their subnets, but like there's a ton of uh, opportunity for people to continue to build on these, these types of networks. And so I think that that, um, that bias of, you know, public versus private is something that's, that's starting to come down. Now it's up to choice, right? Like not everybody needs to build on Ethereum. Like there's a ton of private networks, like obviously Onyx is like probably the biggest one out there um, that some institutions might feel more comfortable with and they might enjoy the experience that there or might have a different use case than like what people are building on a public network. And that's like totally fine. Um, but now I think, you know, we've kind of crossed the chasm a little bit to say like all of these are great in their own various capacities. I think the the challenge is going to be is like, how do I interact with this? Like that to me feels like the biggest friction point still. And if you're a crypto native, it's like, I do this every day. But if you're somebody who like went from, you know, mailing checks to your gardener to do, you know, your, your daily work. And then all of a sudden you were asked to like Venmo them. My mom is like, what the heck is Venmo? Now she's like using Venmo all the time. And she's like Venmoing me stuff. And like that to me, like felt like that would never happen until like, you know, people get more comfortable The network effects get there. And there's like both the sides of the market get comfortable. And that stuff kind of gets abstracted away. Like if you go to Bank of America today and you want to like send money instantaneously, you can use Zelle. It's like that's a fintech platform that like sends money behind the scenes between a bunch of different banks. That's the same thing that's going to happen with tokenized assets. Like the front end experience to this could be a compound or it could be a Uniswap or the front end experience of this could be like I pull up my brokerage account and I buy an asset and like I don't even know where that traded. It's like the same thing when you log into a website like is this on Google's cloud? Is this on AWS? Is this on Azure? Like you have no idea. You don't care. It just works. But that type of stuff is all going to be abstracted away. It's just going to take time to like build that front end experience. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's going to be the exciting part of all this. That's pretty amazing. Um, I, I guess like this is a, a good time to be like, Hey, how do, how do other, other suits and other hoodies find you? Because like, this would be a perfect time to be like, bro, like you, if you need to know anything about RWAs or if you want to tokenize anything or, and then you want to ask, I'm sure the first question you're going to ask me, like, why the fuck do you want to tokenize that? But like mm -hmm. that being said, it seems like you're the first person to talk to. How can people find you? Well, I mean, it's the most TradFi answer ever, but like I'm on LinkedIn, of course. So like find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Twitter, um, you know, at Hilton or Jim. So uh, don't have the spiciest uh, takes on on Twitter, but yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm Jim at superstate.co. I'm a super open guy, so uh, I'd love to have these kind of conversations. Just get me super excited because you know, to the point I made earlier too, like just us talking about our RWAs is cool, but listening about what people want to get out of this is actually really more important for me. And you know, understanding um, the different folks that are maybe interested in this space also helps me understand. Kind of like where the opportunities lie and, and and the kind of things that we can continue to gear our business towards to bring more people on chain that's awesome man um and i just want to say thank you once again for showing up here um it's super cool that you came out uh people from the dow are super excited to learn about rwas and i'm sure our audience will as well um and as jim said reach out to him uh on linkedin or on twitter uh or email you know wherever uh but Super cool guy to talk to. Thank you once again. And the last thing I have to I have to plug, bro. Doge ETF. It needs to happen. <laughs> or a dog ETF. I think I can't think of a better person to make it happen. I'm pretty sure you I mean, and Robbie would be like, bro, this is happening. <laughs> I mean, what's what's amazing is that I mean you can trade perps on Dogecoin on Coinbase now. So like this stuff's happening. Um, so yeah, it's uh you know, the asset class is is super exciting. There's so many awesome things that are happening and, and popping up left, right, and center. And, and to get exposure to this asset class um, in new and interesting ways is going to be like the big unlock, I think, for the space in the next like coming years. Um, and even just like taking like trillions of dollars that are sitting dead weight in a brokerage account and actually doing something fun with them on chain is, is going to be uh, where we're building over the next uh, couple of years. And, you know, it's going to be fun to check in and like, you know, six months, a year, whatever a time frame might be with you guys and kind of see where we're at. Hell yeah, dude. Um, dude, thank you once again. And yeah, man, this is a lot of fun. You got to come back and definitely do this again. Um, 
you know, there's like big things. And when you're in town for consensus, and I'm sure you are, let us know. Yeah. Uh, usually we throw like a big event. Um, I think this year it's going to be, since it's going to be last year in Austin, we throw a huge party. So I'll definitely, hit, you know, hit you up and be like, bro, you should come through. You and Robbie should, uh, you know, tear it up a little bit. Eat, eat too much barbecue and listen to, uh, drink too much <laughs> beer. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely be out there. Um, we're going to be hosting some events around that. So stay tuned on, on our side with some announcements coming up too. But um, I really appreciate the opportunities. It's great to spend some time with you guys.